G'day guys, in this particular video I'm going to be showing you how to find the acceleration of the center of mass of this disc, which is going down this slope just here, which is 30 degrees from the horizontal, and the, the friction force, the friction coefficients between this, this, this slope and this disc are mu s is equal to 0 0.15 and mu k is 0 0.1. Now I strongly recommend you have a shot at this yourself first and come back when you're done. Okay, well hopefully you started the problem the same way I'm about to start, and that's, through a th and that's through a free body diagram. The first thing we know is there's always a force due to gravity acting downwards, mg. We also know that there is a normal force provided from the plane, just here, which is, as you've probably guessed, normal to the, to the surface. And of course we've got a friction force just here, which is, in every conceivable case, up the hill. And I'll call that F. Now, here's a question I want to ask you. Is it reasonable for me to say right off the bat that our friction force is simply mu kn? It seems like it is, and in fact it would be if this was a block sliding down the hill. However, because this is a disk, the problem becomes significantly more complex. This is something we can't assume off the bat. We can't assume that f is equal to mu kn, and here's why. If this disk is under what we call pure roll, then the very bottom of this disk is instantaneously stationary. Now for a proof for why that's the case, please hit this link just here. But if you want an intuitive understanding, know this. If this ball is under pure roll, sorry, if this disk is under pure roll, then the rotational components of the velocity at this point of our disk will perfectly cancel out mathematically with the translational velocity of our disk down the hill, right? I know that's a lot to swallow right now, but basically, let me summarize. If this thing is under pure roll, then we use our, then, then this point is instantaneously stationary, in which case we don't use mu k. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so let's get started. First things first, we need to define an axis. So I'm going to define an axis x down the slope, or y normal to the surface, right? And let's actually start applying Newton's laws. We know that the sum of forces in our x direction is equal to your mass of your disk times your acceleration of your disk in the x direction, right? Well, what are your forces in your x, in your x direction? Well, we've got our friction force, whatever it is, and we've got our component of our gravity force. To find out what the component is, let me just draw it to the side just here. This is our force due to gravity, this is the component in the x direction, and this right here is the component in the y direction. Now, because we know this is 30 degrees, we know this is 30 degrees, which means that we know this is 30 degrees. Now, I'll just call it theta for now to generalize the solution, but I'll make the substitution later. So we know this is going to be mg, which means we know this right here is mg cosine theta, which means we know that this is mg sine theta. Okay, so what are the forces in your x direction? Well, you've got mg sine theta minus, minus your friction force, right? Minus your friction force, because your friction force is in the opposite x direction, and that's going to be equal to m times ax. Now, is that it? Well, not entirely. We know that your acceleration of your center of mass is purely down the hill, right? This ball isn't jumping off the plane. It's not accelerating in the y direction at all, right? Meaning that the acceleration in your x direction is actually purely your acceleration of your center of mass. So, in fact, we can get rid of this subscript x here and actually just replace it with this subscript g, denoting your center of mass, right? Okay, so this is one huge formula. We can't really progress with this so far, so let's see what other formulas we can use. We know that the sum of forces in your y direction is equal to your mass of your disk times by your acceleration in your y direction. Well, what are the sum of forces in your y direction? We've got mg cosine theta, and we've got our normal force. In particular, n is positive, so I'll draw that first. That's going to be n minus mg cosine theta, and that's going to be equal to mAy, or if you like, just zero. That's because your acceleration in your y direction is zero for the reasons I discussed previously. Now finally we're ready to involve torques. We know there's one other equation we can use, and that's the sum of moments, or if you like, the sum of torques, torques about our center of mass of our disk is always going to be equal to your moment of inertia 
of the center of mass of your disk times by your angular acceleration. Now, if we assume the angular acceleration to be in the, in the counterclockwise direction, which is a completely intuitive thing to guess, right? Then look, let's look at the forces, let's look at the torques producing a torque in the positive counterclockwise direction. Well, there's only one, it's your friction force, right? So the torque produced by your friction force will be F times by the perpendicular distance, which is actually just this distance, which is R, the radius of your disk, right? So it's FR, and that's gonna be equal to your moment of inertia of your center of mass, about your center of mass, which is what? M R squared on two. I haven't done a video proving this yet, center of um, moment of inertia for a disk yet, but I will very soon. Now, um, we, we, and we know that's times by our, our angular acceleration just here by applying this formula. I've got a sneaking suspicion that these two formulas can be simplified a little bit. So let me just write this as our normal force is equal to mg cosine theta. And let me also write this in terms of our angular acceleration. Call it a hunch for now that I feel like we're going to substitute our angular acceleration out. First of all, we notice that the r's can be cancelled off. Bam, bam. And if you want, you can times the 2 over here and divide by the mr. So that's going to be 2f over mr. And that's going to be your angular acceleration. So basically, I'm going to call this equation 1. I'm going to call this equation 2. And I'm going to call this equation 3. Now, this is where it gets a little bit complicated. This is where we make an assumption and then test it later on. So let me write that down step by step. If, if... Um, the disk is under, under pure roll, right? And pure roll is, it's, it's purely rolling. There's no slipping involved. Then, then our acceleration of our center of mass is also equal to R alpha. This is a, this is not a circular motion um, formula, by the way. This is, this is derived from a circular motion formula. If you want to see the proof for this, please hit this link just here, okay? And I really want to stress that this is if the, if, the, if the disk is under pure roll. If it's not, this formula doesn't apply, okay? So if this is the case, then this. So I'll call this equation four, okay? Now let's play an algebra game. I've got a feeling we can simplify these equations out a whole lot. Let's substitute ag out from equation one. So let's do equations one and four. Let's play this game. Let's use equations one and four. Well, we know this is going to be mg sine theta minus f is equal to m r alpha. r alpha. Is that all we know? Well, fortunately we can substitute alpha out using this equation. So let's also involve equation three right now and substitute alpha. And so we can write this as mg sine theta, sine theta minus f is equal to m times by r times by alpha, which is actually 2f on mr. Now notice the cancellation. The mrs cancel out quite nicely, leaving us with the final solution that, that mg sine theta minus f is actually equal to, let's see, it will be 2f. 2f. And we can solve for f now, our friction force, and say that our friction force is actually going to be equal to, let's see, it'll be 3 over here, divide it, it'll be 1 third mg sine theta. Okay? So let's take a step back and realize what we've done. This is the friction force that must exist such that this disk is under pure roll. I really want to stress that. This is the friction force if there was pure roll. We don't know if there's pure roll yet. We're trying to figure this out. So let's see if there's a contradiction. The first thing we're going to do is realize that the maximum friction force that can occur, which I will call F max, is going to be equal to mu s times by n, right? Where mu s is your coefficient of static friction. Now it's, it's, it's static because if this thing's under pure roll, then this point is stationary. So basically, we're trying to see if our friction force provided for pure roll is greater than the maximum force that can be provided between this junction. Okay, and I know this is a lot to swallow, but bear with me. So if we if we if we substitute sine 30 and a, and a third, let's let's check this out. Let's find out whether f is greater than f max. Well, if you if you do the math, you'll find out that this term will evaluate into 0 0.17 
mg, and that is actually greater than our maximum friction force, which turns into, once you substitute n for mg cosine theta, which will be 0 0.13 mg. This means that our assumption was wrong. And let me write that down in white. So let me bring this up here. This means assumption of pure roll is wrong, right? Hopefully there was something bugging you by just assuming that the disk was under pure roll. We assumed it was under pure roll, then we found a contradiction because we know that our friction force provided by the junction can't be greater than the maximum possible friction force. Therefore, the assumption is wrong and the ball, the disk, sorry, isn't under pure roll, okay? So this means then the disk is both rolling and slipping meaning that our friction force now, our friction force must be equal to mu kn, right? Or if you like, mu k times by mg cosine theta, right? Which means then, if you, if you plug it all through, that means using equation one, we can say mg sine theta minus mu k mg cosine theta is equal to mag. Notice the mass cancellation with the mass, <laughs> play on words, um, which means that, funnily enough, our mass isn't a function of our acceleration. And then if you, if you plug in all the values, you're left with the final amazing result that your acceleration of the center of mass of your disk is equal to 4.0554 meters per second squared. This is your acceleration of the center of mass of your disk. And if you want to write that in a vector format, then you'll need to draw an arrow here to show direction. And we actually know it's 30 degrees from the horizontal. Okay, so before I end this video, let me do a very brief summary for those of you who have probably just skipped to the very end. We made the assumption that the ball was under pure roll. Then we found there was a contradiction because the maximum friction force was less than the friction force that would be needed. And hence, the disk was both slipping and rolling. And because it's slipping, that means we use our kinetic coefficient of friction formula, which is this. We plug it into our equation one, which is from our dynamics, F equals MA, and press so we get our acceleration for our center of mass. Whew, I hope that made sense, guys. That was a profoundly difficult problem because it, we're dealing with a ball and not a block. If it was a block, it would have been much simpler. Um, but yeah, I hope that made sense. Cheers.